In this tutorial, we'll be going over how to carve a 3D model using your CNC router and the Vectric design software. For this, you can follow along with the model I'm using by downloading it with the link in the description of this video. This is a 3D model of a Stratocaster guitar, which we made in-house, so it is free use. You can use it for whatever. I hope you guys enjoy it. This specific tutorial is not going to go over every single detail of 3D modeling and 3D toolpathing in Vectric. If you'd like a longer tutorial on either how to create 3D models or a full in-depth tutorial on 3D toolpathing in Vectric, please let me know in the comments and I'd be more than happy to put some of them together. So without further ado, let's jump into the Vectric software and get started. So the first thing you need to do is set your dimensions. I ended up doing a very small carving of this guitar because I had scrap wood lying around and I always love finding uses for scrap wood that would otherwise get thrown away or forgotten about with a CNC. And that's what I think is so interesting about CNC is you can really utilize every piece of wood uh, because you can make such small intricate pieces. If you want to do it bigger, uh, the good thing about 3D models is they are scalable, so you can make it as big or small as you want and really not risk losing too much of the resolution of the model. So for this one, I did an X width of 1.8 and a Y height of 3 inches because that's what the material was. And then I just put in a thickness of 1 inch because I wasn't sure how thick the model would actually be once it was scaled to those dimensions. So I figured 1 inch would give me plenty of space and then I'd just go in later and switch it if I needed to. For the Z0 position, you can do either material surface or machine bed. Personally, I like to do machine bed for 3D carvings just because it gives you a more accurate reference point and you don't have to worry about your material being perfectly flat or risk carving away the part that you were using to zero off. So typically you're a bit safer going with machine bed. XY datum position is your own preference and just make sure that you did click single sided and not double sided project. So after you create the project, you're going to go up to File, Import, and Import Component 3D Model. Find your file that you're looking to cut and open it up. That's going to open up this new display window that is pretty much just dedicated to importing 3D models. You can see right now the guitar is oriented incorrectly. So the way you fix that is under Initial Orientation, you have the options Top, Right, Front, Bottom, Left, Back. Uh, sometimes it's just better to click through and figure out which orientation is going to work best, but then you'll kind of build up a familiarity and you'll realize which one you have to click in order to get it oriented the way you want. So for mine, I had to do it uh, with the right orientation, which means it's just flipping it on one of the axes and lining it up so that the face is facing upward but it was still rotated incorrectly along the z-axis. I need it going lengthwise along the y, and right now it's going lengthwise along the x. So you do that at the bottom where it says rotation about z-axis. Click either plus 90 or minus 90 to get it oriented the way you want. With plus 90, it was technically upside down, so I just did minus 90. Then you can go down to the model size and you can set your dimensions. I knew that I was constricted mainly in the x-axis, so I made it 1.6 inches wide, and and that locked the ratio between the X, Y, and Z, so everything else changed accordingly and it stayed in proportion. So that gave me a final dimension of the Y being around two and a quarter inch, and the Z was only about a quarter inch. So after you get it sized correctly, best practice is to click center model. That's just gonna put the model back in the center of your material because sometimes it can shift when you're changing the dimensions and orientation. Once it looks good, hit position and import, and that will bring up this window. Uh, this is right now set to create both sides. This is not a double-sided cut, so that should not be checked. If you're interested in learning about double-sided cuts, we do have a tutorial about that on our YouTube channel, and that will be linked in the description as well. Once all the settings look good, just click Import, and that will bring you to the 3D view of your project, and you can see it is now a colored version of the model that we just imported. So since I know that the model is only a quarter inch thick and that was including the back side, which did not get imported with the front side, the front side's only gonna be about an eighth of an inch. So I definitely don't need an inch thick worth of material. So I'm gonna go back into my set job dimensions and origin panel and I'm gonna change that thickness to 0.375. Then I can just click okay and that should update everything. I don't have any tool paths yet so it doesn't have to recalculate but it's best practice to then go over to the toolpath section and go to material setup. 
click set and that's going to bring up this dialog box which shows you different settings related to your cut and your 3D model specifically. So the biggest one that we're interested in is model position and material. This is essentially telling your G-code where it's placing the model in the amount of material that you have. So you can see right now the gap below the model is 0.2527, which just means the thickness of the model plus that gap below is equal to the entire thickness that we set, so 0.375. Uh, I don't really want it to be that thick, so you can actually set this either by dragging the slider. So if you drag it all the way down, then it's only going to be the height of the model. Uh, and if you drag it somewhere in the middle, you can see the gap that is getting carved away is the gap above and the gap below is going to remain. So I wanted about an extra eighth of an inch on the bottom to give the overall thickness around 0.25 inches. And I always like carving away a bit of the top just because that guarantees that none of the model will get missed because of any uneven material or anything like that. So you can also reorient the model just to make sure that it is placed in the center of your material. As you can see, there's plenty of space above it and plenty of space below it. So that's all looking good and we can press OK and it will bring us back to the 3D view. Now it's time to make the roughing toolpath. So this is essentially the toolpath that just goes in and gets rid of any excess material that the smaller tapered ball nose or ball nose bit is not going to take away as easily. So I like to use end mills for this. You can use ball noses and you can even make it contoured, but again, I can go over that in a much more detailed tutorial if you would like. Just let me know in the comments. For the machining limit boundary, with something like this, it doesn't matter too much. That really is gonna come into play when you're using more complex models, and especially when you use 3D tabs. With something like this, you could really do any of these options and it wouldn't change too much, except selected vectors, we don't have vectors def defined. Material boundary, you're gonna be carving away a lot of excess material that isn't really important to carve away. So your best bet is either doing the model boundary, which means it's just gonna carve where the model is, or selected level, which essentially in this case is doing the same thing. Just out of habit, I ended up doing selected level, but it's really giving the same results as model boundary. So the boundary offset just tells the bit how far past the perimeters of the model you want it to carve. This is pretty good practice just to hog away a bit extra since typically tapered ball noses are angled. So if you have no boundary offset, then the angled section of the bit is actually gonna come in contact with the part of the material that has not been carved away and can sometimes just add stress to your bit. So it's good to have at least a bit of a boundary offset when you're doing a roughing pass. I decided for something of this scale, a quarter inch offset is a bit much, so I just changed it to 1 8 And other than that, the rest of the settings are a bit more specialized, and for something of this scale and this detail, they're really not as important. So with those settings, I was content enough to save this toolpath with the correct bit that I was using and hit calculate. As you can see, given the scale of this, it really doesn't do much. This roughing pass is mainly just for posterity. Uh, you would be able to run this cut without it, and it would save you a bit of time for switching out bits. But just for the sake of sanity and the sake of knowing that everything is where it should be when I do the cut, I'll probably still run it just, uh, just to be safe. Plus, it's good practice to know because if you were doing a larger version of this model, you would definitely want to take away a lot more material than they'd be doing here. So with that set, we're gonna go do the finishing toolpath now. So with any finishing toolpath, but especially one that is as detailed and small as this one, you're probably gonna to wanna to use a bit with a very small head on it. For this project, I'm using a tapered ball nose that has a 1 32nd inch diameter. Uh, that's very, very tiny. Typically I'll use a 16th of an inch and that can give me enough detail. But again, just because of the scale and some of the detail that I wanna come through, I figured go with a smaller one. It will take me a bit more time, but it's more than worth it at the end of the day. If you don't have a bit like this and you're trying to follow along, then I would definitely recommend just scaling up the model. You're gonna be able to use a much larger bit and still maintain a similar amount of detail. It's pretty much just correlative to the diameter of the bit, the amount of detail that you want, and fitting the bit into those detailed spaces. For this purpose, we're gonna use the same machining limit boundary that we used for the roughing pass. And then for the boundary offset, we're actually going to shrink it even more and we're just going to do a 16th of an inch boundary offset because we really don't have to worry about getting detail beyond the model because we are going to be cutting it out of the material. So those settings are looking good and we're just going to name it with the bit that we're using and click calculate. 
So now when we go over and preview the finishing pass, you can see that it gives us a pretty good amount of detail, especially given the scale. There's some things where when you look at the actual model and you look at this, it might look like it's losing a lot of detail, like in the screws or in the pickups or something like that. But actually, I'm pretty confident that when it translates to an organic material like wood, you won't notice those missing and it will just look correct when it's the scale that it is. So one thing I do want to go into a bit with 3D modeling in general is uh, what's called the step over. So the best way to think about step over is to think about mowing your lawn. And when you mow your lawn, you don't go directly next to the line that you just mowed. You kind of put the mower over the previous line a bit as you do the next one, just to avoid any gaps in your grass cutting. So similarly to that, the bit that you're using to do these 3D passes is going to be going back over the line that it just cut in order to give you a much smoother transition from one to the next. So typically smaller step over is going to give you much more detail. You can also bump that step over up if you really don't care too much about the finished detail because it will save you a lot of time. But it is a balancing act between time and detail. How much time are you going to have to spend cleaning it up with sanding afterwards? What do you want the final product to look like? So I can show you here if I bump the step over up to 50%. You can see that we are saving a lot of time. This is actually only going to take three minutes, whereas the other one said it would take 15 minutes. But you can see when I preview it how kind of horrible that looks and how that's really not what we're going for here. But then conversely, if I bump that all the way down to a 1% step over, I mean, you can see how long it takes to even calculate this toolpath. Um, I'll have to speed it up, obviously. And then even how long it takes to preview it but it does give you insanely detailed and smooth results. But I don't think you would really ever have to use a 1% step over. With our 10% step over, we're getting plenty of detail. Again, you are translating this to an organic material that will not hold the same amount of detail as computer graphics will. So it's best to just do a step over that is around 10 to 20% and find out what detail you're going for. So now that we have our 3D toolpaths looking the way we want them to, we need to put in some vector lines to give us an outline. And I'm gonna add a little hole on the top so that you can string a chain or a necklace thing through. I don't know yet, but I know I want a hole on the top. So I'm gonna go over to create vectors and create a circle. And then I'm going to set the diameter of that circle to be 1.25 because I know I want it to be an eighth of an inch thick. And one tip that I can tell you is sometimes the system will not fully register uh, an eighth inch bit into a perfectly one eighth inch hole. So just to give yourself a bit of a margin to work with, I like to add an extra five after the 1.25. So it just knows that it's slightly bigger than an eighth of an inch, but it's not nearly an amount that will actually affect the size of the hole in actuality. So once we get that positioned where we want it to be, I'm gonna go over to the toolpaths and create a pocket toolpath. I'll set the cut depth to the same height as the Z because I know that I want it to cut all the way through. And for the tools, I'm going to select an eighth inch end mill because it has to fit into an eighth inch hole. And then I'll name that correctly and hit calculate. And then you can see when we preview it, a hole goes all the way through. So now we need a vector to cut out the guitar. So in order to do that, we are going to go back into 2D view. We're going to select our 3D model and we're going to go to the modeling tab on your far left. Then you'll find this button here that says create vector boundary around selected components. So when you click that, you'll notice that it just looks like it adds a bit of thickness to the model that you have selected. But if you turn off your model in the uh, layer panel, you can see that it actually created a vector outline. So now we can use that vector outline to do a profile pass. And just like with our pocketing pass, we're going to set the cut depth to the Z because we know that we want it to cut all the way through. We're going to change our bit to an eighth inch end mill. And then we are going to add some tabs because when you cut all the way through, if you're using hold down clamps like I'm planning to use, your project is going to fly off your machine bed because there is nothing maintaining it from doing so. Unless, of course, you're using double sided tape, then you might not have to worry about tabs. But honestly, sometimes it's a pretty good idea to still include them. They're easy to take off if you have your settings right and it's just peace of mind while you're cutting. 
So for this, since the thickness of the material beneath the model is an eighth of an inch, the thickness of the tabs is also going to be eighth of an inch. It's the thickest I can make it without risking losing any detail in the model and with maintaining a good connection. So the length is also a bit long just given the size of this model, so I'm going to change that to 3 eighths of an inch and then hit calculate. So now you'll see we have blue lines going around our model, which just means that's where the bit is going to go. And it looks like it's going to maintain good detail. There's no spots that it really can't reach into. And that's the good thing about making in-house models is you can kind of design them with CNC in mind. So there's nothing in the way. There's no detail lost because of the limitations of three axis machining. So now when we preview, you can see that all the material around the guitar, except for where we put the tabs, gets taken away, and that's exactly how we want it to look. So all the toolpaths are looking good, and if that is what we get off our machine, which we should, then I will be very pleased with the final results. Now it's just time for saving the toolpaths, which is pretty standard if you're familiar with doing any of that. We're just going to save them one by one, so we'll save the roughing first, then the finishing pass, and since we were good about naming them while we made them, you don't have to change them before you save them. One cool thing about this system is that if you have two toolpaths that you want to do at around the same time and they use the same bit, you can actually save them as one file. They'll save in the order that they are listed in on your toolpaths. And that actually saves you from having to upload the next file after the first one's completed. And it's really a nice feature, actually. So with our eighth inch end mill, we're going to do the pocket and then the profile. We're not going to change any of the settings between those two, so we should save them as one file. So in order to do that, they'll save as the order that they are in. Uh, so it's going to be the pocket first and then the profile. But if I were to drag the profile over the pocket, it would do that one first, which we don't want. So make sure both of them are checked in the toolpath list and then go over to save toolpath. And you have to make sure that at the top, visual toolpaths to one file is selected. So with the check mark, that means that it is a visual toolpath. So those are the ones that are going to be saved. And we know that they both are checked because under the toolpaths to be saved, we can see both of our eighth inch end mill toolpaths. So that's all looking good. So we'll go down and we'll hit save toolpath and that will get us ready to bring the material over to the machine and we'll be good to go. So once you have your material set, put it on your machine, make sure your hold down methods are good, home your machine and then set your zero point. One tip I can give you about zero point is that it's best practice to set your zero point with whatever the smallest bit that you'll be using in that project is, or even just put a V bit into your machine and set it that way. That gives you a lot less margin of error and it doesn't matter whether you're doing center of the machine or lower left hand corner. If you have a quarter inch end mill or even an eighth inch end mill, there's a lot of margin of error to not be finding the exact center but with a very small tipped tapered ball nose or a V-bit, you'll know that the point that it comes to is the exact center of the spindle. So that's just a good practice to get into. Once everything's good to go, just load up the right bit, load up the right toolpath, and let it run. So sometimes when you're running projects, you can get a bit overwhelmed. I know that I would when I started using a CNC machine. So at I2R, we put together a little checklist just for all the things that should be squared away before you hit cycle start. So we have a link to that in the description of this video as well. So if that's something that's going to benefit you in your shop, then I'd highly recommend printing it out and just putting it somewhere next to your machine. It's just simple things like making sure your machine is home before you do a project, making sure you set your zero point on the Z for every new bit and related things. So all of these things will typically just become ingrained after you run a CNC long enough. But if you need that extra reminder while you're starting out, that's why we put together that list. So check it out if you think it'll help you. So after all your toolpaths are done, you can just take that piece of material off the machine, take the tabs off, sand them down, put some kind of finish on your material, and you should be good to go from there. So I really like the way this came out. I would love to see it on a bigger scale, and I might do that project later. But until then, if anybody watching this video does it, please share a link in the comments. I would love to see how it turned out. The nice thing about this is it's fully repeatable, so the next day I just put a piece of maple down and carved a lighter version of this model, and I figured it would be a nice pair for whatever I end up doing with this small piece. Maybe some earrings, maybe a necklace, could be cool, I don't know. 
If there are any tutorials you would like to see next or any project ideas that you'd like to see done, I would love to hear them in the comments and I would love to make those kind of videos. But until then, I hope that you get a lot of joy out of doing this project. I hope that this gave you some insight into 3D toolpathing and I can't wait to see what you guys make. So have a good one and take care.